Welcome to the Best of the Oprah Show. Y'all, everybody, hi. In 1998, I went through the uh, infamous beef trial. It was infamous for me. That was down in Texas, and the man who got me through that time was uh, not my attorney, who was Chip Babcock. You need an attorney. But it was Dr. Phil McGraw, because he was the strategist for the entire trial. So he was on my legal team. And, you know, I'd never heard of him until I got put in a room with him. And his no-nonsense style was just what I needed to keep me from really, at the time, falling apart. Because I'm telling you, there is no greater stress than a trial, even when you know you're innocent. And after the trial was over, I invited Phil to come on The Oprah Show to share a little of his kind of no-frills way of talking, straight from the hip advice, because he and I would drive in to the trial every morning together, and he'd be saying those philisms that we now have come to know as philisms. And, you know, things like, well, the rubber's getting ready to hit the road, gal, and they're gonna hand you your ass on a platter. So I said, why don't you come and share some of those bits of wisdom that you've been sharing with me in the car with our audience? And from his first appearance on The Oprah Show, Phil was, um, I'd say he was quite uh, well received. Not exactly a huge hit, because we were accustomed to, on the show, people being polite and saying polite things, as experts often were very polite. And he was in your face. And after he finished the show, after he finished that show, we got a lot of emails from people saying, who is that guy? Who's that guy? And I said, Phil, keep telling them like it is. Then four years later, there we were with Dr. Phil came on just about every week to help our viewers learn strategies to live the life that they really wanted. Telling it like it is every time. We're talking today about how you can begin wherever you are in your life to lead a better life for yourself. Uh, my next guest is here to help lead you in the right d direction. I've chosen him because he is the person who helped me the most getting through my trial in Texas on a daily basis. Without Dr. Phil McGraw, I don't know how I could have gotten through it. He is a trial strategist who is also uh, one of the best psychologists I've ever run into. And I've talked to many, many, many psychologists over the years during the show. And I said to Phil at one point during the trial, if I ever needed therapy, he would be the one I go to. And he said, I don't take clients. So uh, <laughs> anyway, when I was first being sued by the cattlemen, I didn't believe it was happening. And all through the trial, even until the moment I arrived in Texas, I still couldn't believe it was happening. And even when we were picking the jury, I still couldn't believe it was happening. And even after the first day, I still couldn't believe it was happening. And Phil said to me, snap out of it. It is happening, and you need to learn to deal with it. And so that's why we began to strategize, create a strategy for, um, for the trial. What I learned during the trial is, is that the, the trial that I was going through, the courtroom <clears throat> particularly, and I know you do courtroom sciences, is, is a metaphor for all trials in life. Because all trials in life serve to cause you to question, who am I really? What does this mean? Why is this happening to me? And how can I overcome it? And that was, the, what was a big epiphanal moment for me in the trial. And sure. what I realized is that everybody needs a strategy. That's why you're here. People need a strategy. He's the best I've ever seen for developing strategies for life. Phil has prepared a few questions that we want you to ask yourselves. And don't take them lightly, because the number one question is, what do I want? And why is that number one? Well, it's number one because you can't go if you don't know where you're going. And my question to you when, you, when I say, what do you want, I've said a million times, you got to name it before you can claim it. If you don't know what it is you want, and I mean specifically, then you won't even know when you have it. And, and, and you've got to be specific in what you want. Okay, and that's but, something most people just simply don't know how to articulate. Okay, question number two. What are the barriers to having what I want? Yeah, the fact of the matter is, we're talking today about making choices. You're already making choices. I mean, you, the, you, you are where you are today because you've made choices. And, and so the question that I put to you second is... That's so hard for most people to get, though. Well, but it's true. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know it's true, but it's hard. Isn't it hard to accept that wherever you are, whatever's going right or wrong, you are the one who is responsible for it? Yeah, and, and, it, and, and sometimes that's real hard oh, for people hard. to believe because it's so much easier to be Especially a Especially in a trial. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oprah kept saying this just isn't fair. This said, isn't yeah. fair. It yeah. may not be fair, but it is. It is. Okay. And, and but I mean, you got to decide what is it that you think is keeping you from getting where you want to be. I mean, you have to decide what's keeping me from getting where I want to be. I mean, what, what are the obstacles? What are the barriers? And then you got to take them down. A brick at a time, you got to take them down. Now, I think question number three that you have, what <clears throat> must I do to get it, first of all, is so key. Because a lot of people want it, <clears throat> but if you're not willing to do what it takes to get it, that means you don't really want it. You know, most people misunderstand the importance of commitment and willpower. People say, all right, I'm really committed. I really have a lot of willpower for this. But willpower is fickle. And I'm not telling you it's easy. There's no free ride. Uh, I've, I've said before, the difference between winners and losers is winners do things losers don't want to do. Winners do things that losers don't want to do. They discipline themselves. They require more of themselves than losers do because it's, it's just easier not to. And uh, so when you decide, what have I got to do to get it? You got to be very specific and it's got to be programmed so it's not a matter of willpower. Okay, let's talk about the, the question <clears throat> of, I mean, there are, I would imagine millions of women in particular watching right now who, some have written me, some have not, who think that the resolution to their happiness is going to be finding a man or finding something. Isn't that true? Well, it's exactly true. If, and, and I'm not saying that there isn't um, an awful lot of reward to a relationship. Right. And, and certainly there is. But the fact of the matter is, when you give your power away to somebody else to determine how you feel about you, when you decide that somebody else who rejects you has determined your level of value and worth, then you are now a passenger, and that's a bad place to be. You got to take your power back, and you got to say, I decide who I am. I decide how I feel about me, whether you love me or whether you don't. And if your husband leaves you, if your wife leaves you, you may not be able to control them, but you can sure control how you react to it. And that's what you got to do. Well, nobody can turn a phrase quite like Dr. Phil. And over the years, he came up with some doozies, honey. But one of my favorite lessons from him is this one. I remember little hairs on my head and on my arms, little hair. I barely have any. But even the ones I barely have, they stood up when he taught this lesson. You teach people how to treat you. Aha, 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 bing, bing, bing. The first time he said that, he had a moment with a guest who said her husband had just up and left her while she was at work. Just left, no, no, nothing. And she was still pining for that man two years later. But Dr. Phil had a few key questions for her that helped her change the way she thought about things. And this was a great thing about Phil. We would not just be voyeurs in the lives of the audience or in the guests, but what he was able to do was let us see ourselves. So whether that person got the lesson or not, we all did. Chris was married to the same man for 25 years, and then one day she woke up, no note, no explanation, no goodbye. He's moved on, but she still feels like her heart and soul were torn from her body, and she wants to move on and be happy, but doesn't know how. Is that, is that about sum it up? Correct. Yeah. Okay. I read, too, in your letter where you said you'd take him back if he came back tomorrow. Yes. So what do you want to say to Christine? Uh, the, the question I, I've got for you is, what do you want? I mean, we, we've talked about that a little bit, but if we're talking about where you want to be in 2000, answer the question, what do you want? I think I want to be more spiritual, to be able to trust in myself again. Uh -huh. You know, to to be able to rely on myself. So what's keeping you from doing that? I guess I, I've got to um, accept. Accept what? Accept the divorce and move on with my life. Now, don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell no, me no, the that truth. Is, that is what, what, is keep, what is keeping you from feeling better about it? I mean, doesn't it hurt that you're there every night without him? Yes. So tell us about the loneliness in your life. I, I have two children, so they, and I have a, a grandson that I can spend my time with. Mm -hmm. If your husband, and I, I don't know him, and I assume that you're a reliable historian, but if 
he did what you're describing, then would you suggest that he didn't treat you with much dignity and respect? I guess so. I, I've never looked at it that way until I've been you, on the show. You guess so? <laughs> okay, now let me ask you something. Do you think you teach people how to treat you? I don't know. She's you answering know. the question, not y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's I, I a mean, great just, question, Phil. Yeah, yeah, I, fabulous I question. Yeah. I'm just asking you, just real simply, because uh, obviously... Did you hear the question? Yes, I did. Do you think you, that you, you... What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you... <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you taught him how to treat you? Do you think that you taught him that he could disrespect you in this way? No. Well, do you, how do you think he decided to do that? Ooh. I don't, I, I don't know. Well, if you did know, what would it be? <laughs> if you did know why he was treating you that way, what would the reason be? Probably because I let him get away with it. Bingo. You let him get away with it. Bingo! Oh, Bingo! Right. All right, let, That's his start. Let, let me ask you something. I wonder what would happen in his relationship with you if all of a sudden, instead of saying, I just really want you to come back, I'm really hurting that you're gone, if all of a sudden you said, no, wait a minute, I don't deserve this, I'm going to treat myself with dignity and respect, and buddy, if you want in my life, that's the price of poker. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> now, and, and, he may, and he may say, I, I don't want to play if that's the price. And if that's the deal, you're better off to know that right now than you are a year from now or two years from now. Right. <clears throat> and, and all I'm asking you is, can you make part of the goal to be whole again and have self-respect and dignity with him or without it? Well, from the very first show, I started calling him Tell It Like It Is, Phil. And I don't do that for nothing, because in one of his early appearances on the show, we introduced him to a stripper who said that his message had inspired her to change her life. And as you're going to see... Dr. Phil did not waste any time getting down to business. This was fun, actually. Kimberly Hale says that she had dreams of being a Broadway singer and dancer, but her dreams got lost somewhere along the way. Read your letter. Okay. Dear Oprah, thank you for your ongoing commitment to the upliftment of the human heart. For six years, I've been working as a nude, exotic dancer and prostitute performing sexual acts for money in the back, room of, back rooms of strip clubs, hmm. selling my dignity for cash and feeling shameful every minute of the day. After watching your show, I asked myself, is this how you want to feel in the year 2000? Inside, I heard a voice scream, no. I've tried to put into practice the different tips for a better life. Each show was like a golden brick being laid on the path to my heart. After the show, I made the decision to quit my job, but I'm still in so much pain. I want to understand why I've punished myself for so long. I've searched for love in everything from food to money, and nothing has worked. I want my childhood dreams back. I've hit rock bottom. I want to heal my life so I can help inspire others to live the life of their dreams. On The Oprah Show, there was a strategist who helped a young girl face her fears. Do you think he could help me? I really want to live. That is some letter, Kimberly. <laughs> we got through it. Well, you, you, you mentioned um, in your letter uh, there was a strategist who helped a young girl uh -huh. face her fears. That strategist uh, is Dr. Phil McGraw. And Phil, how are you, hon? I'm doing well. Doing well. Phil is back here. Meet Kimberly. Kimberly, good to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Put up a chair for Phil here. Um, he's one of the best uh, psychologists I've ever run into, behavioral experts, and he is a life strategist. He's also very direct, people. Uh, I actually call him, tell it like it is, Phil. <laughs> uh, so the truth may hurt sometimes, and I've been in the position where he hurt my feelings, and I just kind of pulled him back in. When he steps on my feet, I say, ouch. 
Ooh. Uh, but the truth may hurt sometimes, <clears throat> but uh, it will also set you free. So that's what he's here to do today. As kindly as possible, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it one way or the other. There isn't any in between. That's right. Okay. Phil, what do you want to say to Phil? I really want to know and have a greater understanding of why I've spent my whole life sabotaging everything that I've had so many opportunities and feeling undeserving. And I've contemplated it. And for me, I. I don't know what that is. Well, I guess my question is, um, when you say you want to change, mm -hmm. I mean, do you really? I do want to change, and I can say that I took the job away, but the feelings are still there. Let me tell you something. I, I, I'm just going to be real honest with you, OK? Uh, because if we're talking about changing people's lives, and you know, we can come on this show and we can be entertaining mm. and we can tell people what they want to hear, but if the true measure is changed lives, then I have a responsibility to tell you what it really takes. And I'm telling you what it really takes, number one, is to be honest. I mean, really, no kidding, honest. And when I say honest, I mean that you, you've got to acknowledge where you've been, you have to acknowledge why you've been there. And my question to you, you've been spending all of this time stripping, doing sex acts for money in the back of strip clubs and that sort of thing. You say, I want to change. Well, first, what were you getting out of that? What was your payoff that you're willing to leave behind to go to something else? What was my payoff from it? We only Moment. do what works. We only do things that work, and that means you get a payoff for what you're doing. If you weren't getting a payoff from it, you would not do it. What was your payoff? Money. It's more than that. I felt powerful for a moment in some ways. Well, are you willing to give that up? I have to. No, you don't have to. I you want can keep to, doing exactly what you want to. Because otherwise, I don't. <clears throat> My life has no meaning in that way. Mm -hmm. And I would rather be dead than continue living that way. When you were growing up, you had dreams? Yeah. Was your dream to be a stripper? No. Was your dream to be a prostitute? No. So when did they take your dream away? When I was a kid, I, I just being told I wasn't what I thought I was. You want it back? And it means you got to be willing to get real. Do you think your letter was real? Parts of it. Because I have to tell you, when I read your letter, I absolutely was moved by your courage. I was moved by your strength. I was moved by your courage. But I have to tell you, I, I walked away from that saying, you are hiding in that letter so much. I, I read what you said, upliftment of the human heart, laying bricks of gold on the pathway to my heart. Do you really think like that? Do I, I hope for that. Okay, let me stop you. Okay. Because I told you this was going to be hard, right? No, I... <laughs> and, and let me tell you something. If, if you were on a motorcycle and you were getting ready to jump over this whole building here, mm -hmm. and I knew you had to be going 90 miles an hour to make it, and you were coming up the ramp at 60, you think I ought to tell you? Yeah. Well, you're doing about 40. You're doing about 40 because you're not being honest with yourself. And I don't want you to fall back where you were. I don't we want have to. to have a plan and we have to be willing to be honest. And I mean brutally honest. And girl, when I read this and you say, I want to be able to inspire the world to do all that they can do. Girl, we just need you to go to work and keep your clothes on to start with. OK, let's get you to work every day with some dignity and with your clothes on before you're curing and healing the world. That's grandiose, and you will never make it happen if you don't start with you first. Do mm. you believe what I'm telling you? Yeah.
We're talking to Kimberly, who says she wants to change her life. She wrote me this um, uh, very moving letter saying, I want to heal my life so that I can help inspire others to live the life of their dreams. She was, you know, exotic dancing, stripping, prostituting, the whole thing. Uh, what we're talking about is making a change for the better wherever you are in your life. Um, uh, you don't have to be at rock bottom <clears throat> to, to make a better life for you. But in order to do that, Phil, we, you and I have talked about this before. You got to get real with yourself. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. And I, you probably believe that I'm being very harsh with you. But my, my point is, you have come so far, I don't want you to set yourself up for failure. And you can set these lofty goals and ignore the fact that if this world is going to change, it's going to change one mind, one heart, one spirit at a time. Tell us about shame in your life. Letting people, letting people touch me, letting people abuse me every night after night after night and sitting there and saying, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here. What would you say if I told you that your shame is just a really convenient way to avoid being everything you can and will be? that you use your shame as an excuse, that you hide behind it. I'm not quite. Well, isn't it pretty convenient? If you're ashamed of yourself every day, then how can you be expected to be all that God planned for you to be? Right. How, I mean, God didn't make any junk. You're the one that's put that label on it. Right. You know, I can tell you what you want to hear, or I can tell you what you need to hear. And I'm telling you, number one, you are really down on you. I mean, the whole time you've been sitting here, you've been looking at the floor. You don't look me in the eye. You don't look Oprah in the eye. You don't look these people in the eye. And I'm telling you until you say, it's over and I start right now with me, then you're gonna stay right where you are. Shame is a real convenient way to avoid life. I can't get engaged with people. I can't contribute. I can't do the things I want to do because I'm so ashamed. Yeah. It's Pat, it's there isn't a person in this room, I don't believe, who has not done something in their life, you know, didn't have to be prostitution, but hasn't done something in their life that they were ashamed of. But we move forward. Life is about learning from your mistakes, learning from the past and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So do you agree with Phil that you have been hiding behind the shame? I've been hiding behind my shame and I've been using that as an excuse to not live a life of, that I could be proud of. Okay, so what we're interested in is in concrete results and change. So what commitment are you willing to make to all of us here and to yourself, most importantly, uh -huh. so that the next time we visit with you, mm -hmm. we can say, from this day to this day, you have done... Right. Well, first of all, to say that I forgive myself for my past you know, it's hard, because I can say and say that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I feel it, you know, because I don't want to, I don't, words are, you know, like you said with the letter, words are words. Sure. Action is something else. And I know I have to get a job as number one. And to say uh, that I'm willing to move forward from today the forgiveness, I can't say that I, I don't know how to let that go and to say that it. Then that must become your goal. That must become your goal until you find the strength, until you find the commitment, till you find the willingness to be able to say, I forgive myself because I'm not going to stay in this prison anymore. And, and that's my whole point. You aren't willing to give up the payoffs. If you give up the shame, if you claim the forgiveness, then you got to walk with your head up and be accountable for the rest of your life. And that is the beginning, and you don't want it. I do want it, though. I want... It's like that I didn't deserve to have... And you still don't think you deserve. You don't think you deserve to be forgiven. I don't know how you can, I mean. And that's just the truth. 
I mean, I, you know, I can tell you what you want to hear, or I can tell you the truth. If you don't want it, then you won't claim it, and if you don't claim it, you won't have it. You're telling us right now that you don't think you deserve to be forgiven because you can't forgive yourself. We can forgive you, <laughs> can't we, audience? We can forgive you, but us forgiving you, my forgiving you, because, listen, you're a human being just trying, trying, trying to find your way. You are still God's child. Spirit come from the greater spirit. I know that. So I know that whatever you did is just something that you did. You are not that thing. You are not prostitution. You are not anger. You are not meanness. You are not confusion. You are spirit come from greater spirit with great potential. And so that's easy to forgive. You don't know that yet, though. And that is the first step, isn't it? It's got to be the goal. Because you can't move forward until you can let that go. It's got to be the goal. say that was the past. You know, Maya always says to me, you did then what you knew how to do. And when you knew better, you did better. Uh That's what every human being does. Dr. Phil has been the spark that ignited so many light bulb moments on The Oprah Show. I remember back in 1998 when we introduced Phil to a viewer named Joanne Compton. Wow. Now, you know, you're just going through your daily show and you don't know when a guest comes on that that's going to be a moment that lives with you forever. Well, Joanne Compton was grieving for her murdered daughter, Lori Ann. Joanne's goal was to tell her daughter's story to the world, and then go home and kill herself. Now, she's been grieving now for 10 years, had left the room the same, hadn't been able to go into the room, was still stuck in the day that her daughter was murdered. So, with Phil's help, Joanne did so much more than move forward that day. She had, watch this, watch it when it happens, you'll see. She had a true aha light bulb moment, the kind that I just live for on TV. Not only did she have it, she actually said the words that I so long to hear on television when somebody sees something and never thought of it that way before. Watch. No. Ten years ago, Lori Ann Powell was having the time of her life. She was 18, vibrant and popular. She loved her rock and roll music and the glamour of entering local beauty pageants. Then the mother's unspeakable nightmare happened. Laurie disappeared on a lonely country road, and Joanne Compton's torment began. Police found her body in a nearby river. She'd been stabbed to death. Investigations led nowhere, and Laurie's murder remains unsolved. When they found Laurie Ann, she didn't have anything on her. Just a little stud earring. No clothes, no pocket foot. No jacket, just that one little earring. In the 10 years since Lori disappeared, daily life has stood still for Joanne. I will never be able to come to terms with this. To me, Lori died today just as easy as she died 10 years ago. Time has not healed Joanne Compton. Each day she says the loss feels like a hole that gets deeper. I keep her alive. And my thoughts, just thinking about her smile. Lori is buried in a cemetery near the family home. Her mother, though, still is waiting for some kind of peace. Joanne uh, wrote to uh, Dr. Phil, and uh, she wants to end her obsession with this tragedy. She knows that she is obsessed, and she wrote to Dr. Phil McGraw, asking for help. Phil is here with a plan to help Joanne and all of you who are watching today who are still stuck in grief. Move on. This is a show for anyone dealing with a tragedy. What is it you want to say about your daughter? That Lorianne was a person, that she deserved to live, that she didn't deserve to be thrown away like a bag of trash. <laughs> They threw her away in the river like a bag of trash. And she didn't deserve that. 
And I miss her so much. It just <clears throat> aches inside so bad. And I wanted somebody. I just wanted to go to the tallest mountain top and scream and let people know the pain. The pain that will never go away because of this. Do you want it to go away? Yes. I mean, do you really? Yes, sir, I do. I'm going to be real honest with you here. This is by far the hardest show I've done and may be the hardest show I ever do. Because when you lose a child, I can only imagine what it means to you. But I want to know, what did it do to you when they took your little girl away from you? It ended my life. I no longer wanted to do anything. I don't want to feel joy or happiness. I don't want to <clears throat> smile. They destroyed me. All I can think of is I'm still here and she never even got a chance. They cheated me out of my grandchildren. They cheated me out of the time I would have had with her as a mother and daughter. The times I would have been able to experience things with her that a mother and daughter experience and share. I know this is a terrible thing to say, and I have tried in my heart, I really have, to forgive. But I hope they're in the same hell I am. I hope they're suffering just like I am. I hope every day for them is just as bad as it's been for me. But I pray that they don't do this to anyone else. And I hope that someday God will take care of them as he's promised. So now you're stuck. Ten years, you have not been able to move on. And you have watched, Cindy, your mother not be able to move on. What do you want to say? Well, I just want to tell her that um, I need you. I need you there as a parent, a friend. Um, when we lost Lori, you lost a daughter. I lost a sister. And it was really hard to find someone to um, understand the pain I was feeling because um, obviously you couldn't be there at that time for me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to let you come up here and say that to her. How about that? About that, you can have my chair. Um, it was just really hard for me to um, deal with that. I felt like I was dealing with that alone. Um, do you I want just, your mother back? I do. I want her there 100%. Just look her in the eye and tell her, I need you back. I need you back, and I need you back as my parent and as my friend. I'm so sorry, Cindy. I'm really sorry. Let me ask you both something, and I'll address this to you, because, Cindy, I think you've moved on. I think you feel like you have some closure. I do. You haven't forgotten your sister, have you? You don't no. love her any less. No. But I think about her every day. You think about her every day, but you're not obsessed with it. No. And, and you feel that you are. Oh, yes. Okay. But can you accept the fact that the length and depth of your grieving does not reflect the length and depth of your love. You can love somebody this much, and if you, and then if, if, you, if you grieve for a year, that doesn't mean that you only loved them that much. That sounds foreign to you, doesn't it? Yeah. Because you walk around and you say, how can I be laughing today and my daughter is dead? But I'm asking you now, can you at least entertain the fact that how long you grieve is not a reflection of how deeply you loved your daughter. I believe I do. Can you accept that if you get closure on this, if you say, I'm not going to be obsessed with this anymore, that you are not betraying your daughter? Yes, I think I can. If she could talk to you right now, do you think she would say, Mother, I want you to hurt every day for the rest of your life to prove that you loved me? Oh, no. Do you she, think that's what she would say she to you? She would be very angry at me over this. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be a betrayal. 
Maybe the betrayal is focusing on the day of her death rather than celebrating the event of her life. She lived for 18 vibrant and wonderful years, and you focus on the day that she died. I never thought of it that way. I really never thought of it that way. Well, maybe it's time to say, I'm going to do that. Maybe it's time to say, I'm going to focus on her life and celebrate what I had rather than what I lost. Do you suppose that's a possibility? Oh, yes. That would be nice. <clears throat> that would be very nice. But it means you have to let her go. You have to give her to God and say, I'm gonna, I'm, this is your job now. I'll never forget. I'll never stop loving. You'll never stop being part of my life. But it's time that I move on with your sister and with my life take you with me in my heart, but I'm not going to be obsessed with this anymore. I'd like to work towards that. I really would. I'd like to be able to do that. Okay. We're going to see if we can help you with that. Will you take one more step with me? Yes, sir. I mean, one more really big, big step? Sure. Because what I want you to do right now is I want you to make a decision that says, I've got to get up tomorrow and not be consumed with what I'm doing. You have to be willing to say in your heart to Lori, I've got to let you go. I've got to say goodbye. I've got to let you go. Turn your chair and face me. Get real close. OK? OK. I want to ask you. Is it time to say bye to Lori? Yes. Because you know you can hold her in an earthly bond, don't you? Yes, I do. Because I want to tell you a story that I think is really, really important to think about. Because it's a story that I heard a long time ago that meant a lot to me in my heart. Because I believe that Lori is in a wonderful place without pain and without hurt, without fear. But if you're holding on to her, she can't go on. And the story said that every day, all of the young people would gather around God and light a candle and go for a walk, a wonderful, beautiful walk through a park, and everything was great, and everything was wonderful. But there was one young lady that always sat on the side and would never go on the walk. And they asked her one day, Lori, why will you never go with us? And she said, because every time I light my candle, my mother's tears put it out. Can you let her go? Can you let her light that candle and let her go? Yes, I can. I want to. I really want to. I don't want you to want to. I want you to do it. I want you to say right now, Lori, I'll love you till the day I die. I'll love you till I see you again. But I got to let you go for you, for me, for Cindy, and for your dad. Say it now. Lori, I love you. I'll love you for the rest of my life. I'll never forget get you. I'm going to let you go. I need to let you go. God. I'm going to let you go, Lori. I need to let you go for me. I need to let you go for Cindy. I need to let you go for your daddy. But most of all, I need to let you go for yourself. I'm so sorry. Just tell her, be well, baby. Be well, baby. I love you. I love you very much.
A lot happened to you in this hour. Yes, it has. And you just said to me um, during the commercial break, you said I was going to leave here with a plan. Yeah. And now you've changed your plan. What was the plan? <sighs> I thought after I would made this goal that now I could go home. I'm sorry. I was gonna go home and take my life. <laughs> because I wanted so bad to reach this goal. And I felt like once I reached it, I could just let go. And I didn't know how to let go without just going away. <laughs> but now you've changed your mind. Oh, yes, I've changed my mind. Well, thank you, Phil. This was a good day for you. Uh, this was a good day. This is a good day. Wow. Did you see that? Did you see that moment when she says, I never thought of it that way before? That is pure transformation. I live for that. Thank you, Dr. Phil. And thank you for watching the best of the Oprah show. I'll see you next time. It's good.